there is a subsidiary and together they form part of a group right now a company cannot sell to itself a company cannot purchase anything from itself similarly a group cannot have any sale or purchase from itself again right so that means that if a parent is selling to a subsidiary it is allowed a subsidiary is selling to parent that is also allowed i mean for accounting purposes but a group wherein a parent sells to subsidiary and a subsidiary sells to parents or vice versa as the case may be the group will not have these functions coming in right we just cancel out these functions because otherwise we are looking at a very big scalability which has no meaning at all right that's what we understood yesterday there was a small concept a small talk about impairment which we didn't cover we're going to talk about that impairment what right? when i say impairment that simply means that my investment into some company has been impaired that is for example if i have an asset the value of that asset would not give me that much of benefit which i expected right what i mean to say is when we covered goodwill goodwill is nothing else but no investments no impairment is not like this investment we're going to just understand the meaning there of what exactly is impairment by way of just looking at this example when i say goodwill it is nothing else but a premium paid right when i say a premium paid i would pay this premium for some expected benefits right when i say expected benefits they could come in form of synergies for example tata motors acquired jaguar right now jaguar is very much into the same you know domain same industry so they know that tata tata motors would know when they acquired jaguar they would acquire a technology from uk right when microsoft acquired uh, rather when i think it was microsoft which acquired skype or was it google i wouldn't remember that but i think it was google yeah when google acquired skype they know that skype has a huge database of people and they would use this technology of you know skype for for the benefit of their own right so when you talk about these expected benefits that is synergies you are looking at some future benefits to come to you right now when i say a future benefits coming in and there is of course a control that you have over uh, this other company that you have acquired these two form part of something called as a definition of a asset now this is nothing else but goodwill when i say goodwill it is an asset indeed we just use the term intangible asset for that purpose right but when i say that i have an asset let's say i have paid 100 crores extra to acquire another company so that would be my goodwill but if this investment or this goodwill doesn't give me that much benefit to the extent of at least 100 crores i would say that my investment has been impaired right that simply means that i would need to write off my goodwill to the extent of the impairment okay with that this is what is this is what is actually impairment nothing beyond that right now if i just use this terminology we yesterday also talked about something called as non controlling interest right the shareholding in which me as a parent i have no role in right that belongs to outsider when i say non controlling interest we talked about two perspectives that it can be measured at fair value and second it can be measured at proportion of assets of the subsidiary right when i say i'm measuring nci at fair value my goodwill calculations were purchase consideration minus net assets again minus nci at fair value right similarly in this case also it was a purchase consideration minus assets minus nci at proportion of the assets right now one important thing i would like to distinguish that while i have made in the made an investment in the shares of subsidiary it is that subsidiary which is not going to give me that much of benefit and that is the reason why the word impairment comes into the picture right now 
it simply means that investment in subsidiary has been impaired the way we look at this investments or this particular impairments accounting is that whatever investment I have made for example I have made say an investment of uh, let's say 500 rupees that is I bought the shares of another company in which I have a control now that becomes my subsidiary right now by virtue of the assets acquired and uh, amount paid and further an NCI for example if I'm having a you know not 100% shareholding I had my bank outflow of 500 let's assume that I acquired shares worth uh, 800 I had an NCI of uh, maybe 400 I'm just putting it like that right and finally I have my goodwill to the extent of this 100 right now this 100 becomes my asset and let's presume that this investment is not going to give me this much of benefit even to the extent of 100 that means that I must need to impair this goodwill so when I say that I'm impairing goodwill one obvious impact is that my goodwill is going to be written off and the second impact is going to be a charge on my PNL as an impairment loss. Let's say if my goodwill is impaired to the extent of 50, I'm going to reduce the value of my goodwill by 50, and of course I'm going to create a charge into my PNL. Now this PNL charge is of course into the group's balance sheet or group's PNL, right? And when I say group's PNL, we were covering it even before that I would have my parents retained earnings and my subsidiaries retained earnings. Now this impairment essentially belongs to the investments made in the subsidiary. So ideally speaking this loss should be taken into the subsidiaries p &L or retained earnings right. Now the only catch remains is when this is taken on a proportionate basis that means that if I said that my goodwill is nothing else but purchase consideration, I am just writing that formula once again, minus net assets minus NCI which is a percentage of this, whatever the percentage may be, 40 percent, 30 percent as the case may be. Now at this point in time my NCI calculation is based altogether upon the net assets. So the goodwill that has been identified in this case precisely belongs to the parent and not the NCI right because this NCI calculation is purely determined on the basis of the net assets the fair value of the net assets hence the goodwill that we talk about if at all it gets written off that's where it is going to charge to the P uh, to the parents retained earnings however if it were calculated on fair value that is my NCI is not calculated on a percentage but on the basis of market value at that point in time this goodwill belongs to the subsidiary and the parent together. So what I do is I would simply charge it here and of course whatever the remaining profit is there something will go to the parent and something will go to the NCI. So that's what you would like to remember here when I have an impairment of goodwill if my NCI is calculated on a proportionate basis I will charge it to a parent if it's calculated on a fair value basis I will charge it to my subsidiary because it eventually gets transferred to both parent as well as NCI okay with that right superb now this was one of the concepts which is usually tested in the examination so I mean it's not carrying a huge weightage but obviously it's an important distinction for the purpose of calculating NCI right now when we do that talk of that is parent and subsidiary is equal to group together right now a group cannot sell anything to itself a group cannot purchase anything from itself again right that simply means there is no receivable there is no payable also and this further means there is no profit or loss also that means that if a group is selling something to itself that is an intra company or inter company group uh, uh, you know inter company sales and purchases if there is one company making a profit by selling to other 
in the standalone statement it's a profit but in the group statement it's no profit at all unless this item or this profit has been realized by the group for example let's say that p has an item which cost 100 rupees it sells to s for 150 rupees right so it is a purchase by s of course to the extent of 150 only right now at this point in time there is a profit earned by p also to the extent of 50 standalone statement it is okay standalone statement is okay standalone statement is also okay however if this purchase by s remains in the inventory of s that is s has not sold it further to anybody else that means that the group made a purchase of 100 actually which is lying as an inventory to the value of 150 so this profit as well as the value of inventory has to be decreased to that effect right that is why that's where you talk about something called as unrealized profits right now one more important thing to understand here is the subsidiary should have this back in the inventory that is for example we had a cost of 100 made a sale of 150 and there is a purchase by 150 and let's say that s has sold the same item for 200 to let's say z which is an outsider right if this sale of 150 uh, you know this purchase of 150 has become 200 sale and has been sold to z that simply means one one thing that i had my sale in the books of p of 150 and a purchase cost of 100 resulting into a profit of 50 i had a sale of 200 here and a purchase of again giving me a profit of 50 now actually speaking the group purchased it for Uh, group's purchase was of 100 do you agree with me initial purchase was of this amount and final sale was of resulting into a profit of 100 so when same item has been sold off by the buying company that is outside the group the profits have been realized at that one in time I may say from the group's viewpoint that there is no sale or purchase within the group but yes there are profits we cannot deny that right however in the same example if I say that fifty percent of goods are not sold by S that means yes there was a sale I think I can just save some time like this. So this is parent, this is subsidiary, and of course we look at group also. Let's say the 50% of goods were not sold. There was a sale by 150, or there was a sale of 150 against the cost of 100. That becomes 50. There is a purchase of 150 here, right? Of which only 50 percent have been sold now again just taking that proportion we had sold 100 percent goods for 200 let's assume that 50 percent are sold for 100 only right this becomes my sale now do you agree with me that of this 150 75 closing inventory right so i have an inventory to the extent of 75 that gives me a net profit of 25 and it is rightly done so because the item for uh, okay what was that I had a purchase of 150 from subsidiary's viewpoint I sold 75 worth goods for so this is my purchase cost I sold it for 50 right and that's where I would have a profit of 25 however if I just go back and see from the group's viewpoint there is a sale of 150 here to here i would say it's not a sale exactly right so there is a sale in need of 100 only 
because there is an intra group sale and purchase coming in. There is a purchase of 100. I agree with that too because initially the purchase done of was of this much. But then there is still an inventory remaining to the extent of no, it's not 75 over. It's going to be 50. Because originally whatever I bought for half of that particular item is not seen, not yet been sold. So there is a profit underlying is of 50 only. So what I what I see is basically that while the profits are 50 and 25, the actual profit is only 50. So I would see this unrealized profit to the extent of 25, which is lying in the books as a profit made by parent. Right? So the parent's profitability is increased to the extent of 25, that is one. And the inventory of subsidiary, which is yet unsold, that is also increase to that extent. So when I see, when I look at this adjustment, I have, I am just dropping this or clearing this, in terms of my URPs, that is unrealized profits, I would like to see that the parent sold earned profit, right? Not earned by the group, right? Subsidiary purchased inventory value increased not of the group again, right? That simply means when I prepare my balance sheet for example, that is my group's balance sheet. I will have my inventory of both parent and subsidiary because these are physical goods lying both in the books of parent and subsidiary respectively. So that has to be reduced by this unrealized profit from subsidiary's books and the retained earnings. I would reduce this unrealized profit from the books of parent because the parent actually sold it at an amount which was not realized by the group. Okay with that? When I say that, just to, just to you know, put it everything in a nutshell, and this one, one of the easiest ways to understand this concept is, just look into it. Who sold to whom? If the parent sells, the profit lies in the books of parents. It has to be eliminated. When subsidiary purchases, of course, then the inventory of subsidiaries increase to that extent, it has to be reduced. And it does happen, by the way, even the other way out. If a subsidiary sells, now the profit is lying in the books of subsidiary, which has to be eliminated. And of course, this inventory is lying in the books of the parent, which has to be reduced in the balance sheet. So you would see two impacts coming in. When I say who sold to whom, reduce retained earnings of the seller. Right? So I may write it here. And let's say who sold to whom that is the other party. Reduce inventory of buyer. Okay with that? Do you think it makes sense? Superb. I may want you to have a look at uh, a small question which is uh, this is on page number 149. I'll just write the facts here. Meanwhile, you have a reading of this. This is example number 8 in your Kaplan book. I will just prepare some balance sheet very quickly. That is 4000, that is 2000, this is 2000. I have current assets inventory, others. 100, 150, 300. 
and then I have share capital 6000 1500 I have my retained earnings 1600 750 and my liabilities to the extent of 400 and 200 so I'm sure the total would match it says that and this is dated okay they haven't mentioned it says that P acquired 70 percent of S when retained earnings were how much 250,000 right so this is 250 and during the year P sold goods to S so P made a sale so P sold to S for 120 Mark of 20 percent, right? The NCI should be measured using the proportion of assets. So when you say that NCI is equal to proportion of assets, that is 30 percent of the total assets, right? This is what my question is all about. Yep, we'll just keep this information for the time being. Now, if I look at my first working, that is of the goodwill, can I just start doing that? I had my purchase consideration. So purchase consideration is 2000 Baba. Oh, yep, so there is an investment made into subsidiary to the extent of 2000, right? Minus net assets. When I acquired the company, I do not know how did my balance sheet look like. So what I do is, I represent my net assets through share capital and retained earnings. My share capital at that point in time is 1500, right? 1500. And my retained earning on that date was 250. That gives me 1750. And my NCI is based on the proportion of this assets. Right? What is the percentage? It's 30 percent. That would be 175 into 3. That is going to be 350 and 525. That gives me outer column as 25. And when I reduce that, I have 770. 5 as my goodwill. Right? I have got my goodwill to the extent of 775. I would like to remember this. I will just put it here. 775 is my goodwill. Okay with that? One of the most important, one of the basic calculations that you do in examination for this. Right? Now, my second point is retained earnings. Right? I will have my retained earnings as per question. That is parent and the subsidiary. I have 1600 here yes. and 750 it is right or 700 yes. it is 700 no this is the 750 is it yes. okay I'm sorry it doesn't look like 750 though so this is 750 now I would reduce my pre acquisition right and they were 250 I'm left with 500 now there's one more information that P sold 2S for 120 at a market of 20 percent right now if you remember we we would have done long time back a formula so I am not reading this information here we did a formula of cost plus profit is equal to sales now there is a markup on cost so if I say my cost for 100 my profit would be uh, 20 and my sales would be 120 right that simply means that there is a profit of 20 on the sales which is not yet realized by the group right so out of this 120 sale 20 is the profit which is yet to be earned by the group right so i would say minus yeah oh okay my mistake i think half of the goods remain in the inventory that simply means that while the sales were 120 goods were 60 were not sold so accordingly my percentage is going to be that's 20 by 120 into 60 that is going to be 10 so this 10 is actually an unrealized profit in the books of parent do you agree with me so I would reduce the same from my parents column. Okay with that? Fair enough? Any other information? No. That's all. So I have this 500. I am going to distribute that between the parent and the subsidiary. 70% goes in back here. 
and this goes to NCI to the stint of 150. Right? So I will have my total column as 1940. This becomes my group's retained earning, going to be a part of my final balance sheet. Alright? I will just put it here that group's retained earning is 1940. Can I also calculate NCI at this point in time? I had my NCI initially, uh, do you remember that amount? The proportion of the assets, was it 775? Plus an extra share of 150 that gives me 925. Right? This is what it is. So I've got all my information at this point in time. And what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to prepare my group's balance sheet as in one of the columns here. If I look at my group's balance sheet, do you agree with me there are physical assets of parent and that of the subsidiary it is going to be 4000 plus 2000? Right? My investment is cancelled against this equity yeah. and some extent of this. We'll talk about that as well. So there would be no investment here. My inventory. I have an inventory of 500 plus 150 minus, minus 10 out of 150. Right. So there was an inventory inflated to the extent of 10 in terms of the group's inventory. I would reduce that. Right. Other assets, they would be simply the same. 1500 plus, plus 300. That gives me 1800 and this is the total of 640, right? Whatever the total is, I'm sure that it should match. My share capital representing the parents' equity, 6000. My group retained earnings were 1940. I think I missed something by the way. My goodwill should also have been there. I just missed that. 775, right? And finally, I have my liability. Now, before that, there is an NCI also, which I calculated to the extent of. 925 and finally I have my liabilities that is 400 plus 200, plus 200 that gives me 600. Okay with that? Fair enough? Do you think it makes sense? Now one, one thing I would like to clarify here. When I prepared my retained earnings chart, can you help me know the figures once again as per question? 1600 and 750. We reduce that uh, pre-acquisition, 250, right? That gave me 500. I had a goodwill of 775. Now imagine a situation that my question says that goodwill impaired to the extent of 20%. Right? Now what we're saying is, while this company was acquired, yes, there was a premium paid, but now some amount of goodwill has been impaired because you do not see that much of recovery coming in. When it, when it happens like that, I would say 20% of my total goodwill is impaired. One impact is, I would reduce my goodwill value. And second impact is, I would in, reduce my profitability also. Right? Now, if I say 20% of this, can you just calculate this figure? What, what is going to be? 77.5 plus 77.5. That is going to be 155. Right? So, I would say that, in this case, how do I charge this 155 to my, you know, uh, from the parent share. If I say that my NCI is on a proportion of assets, I would charge to the parent share. Right? So it would get reduced by this amount. However, if it were taken on a fair value basis, I take it from here and eventually the impact has obviously gone to both the parent as well as NCI. Okay with that? Make sense? Great. Now this would formally cover your chapter but even before that on the same logic we would like to understand one small thing another small thing rather wherein one company is selling assets to another company so physical assets being sold and it does happen by the way in real life that companies have some cars machines aircrafts and these kind of physical you know, buildings for that matter right so one company that is a parent may sell to a subsidiary a non-current asset. When it happens, for example, there is a building worth dollar hundred million, which is sold to the subsidiary for, let's say, dollar one fifty million. Right? Do you agree with me in the parents' books? 
there is a profit of 50 million dollars from the group's viewpoint. Is it a profit? No. From the group's viewpoint, the building is still the same. Otherwise, companies would keep on doing that. Right? When I say from the group's viewpoint, there is no profit. I, my retained earnings would be showing this profit within the parent share. I would reduce this profit from the parent's books. Or rather, I would just reduce the profit from the books of the company which has sold this for a profit. Again, the same question. Who sold to whom? Whosoever sells at a profit, from that particular company's retained earnings, the profit would be reduced. Indeed. Absolutely, yes. Now, important thing to understand is, this building, this particular asset would have been subject to a depreciation. Right? Now, this company would have charged depreciation. Let's say it is 10%, just for simplicity's sake. Let's say the depreciation rate is 10% here. The company would have been charging a depreciation of 10 million. But after the sale, this company is charging depreciation to the extent of 15 million. Okay with that? Right? This is okay in the individual books. And once it is sold, this is also okay in the individual books. But from the group's viewpoint, the asset's value is still 100. Right? So when the asset's value is 100 and the rate is 10%, this excess depreciation should be reversed as well. Right? So what I am saying is, if somebody is making a profit, reduce that. And somebody is charging excess depreciation, I should also reverse that. Right? So one impact is, the seller's profits are reduced and the buyer's profits are now increased because of some charge which should not have been made from the group's viewpoint. Right? Just keep in mind, we are not doing any adjustment in the standalone balance sheet or standalone retained earnings. We are preparing it on behalf of the group. How should my group's number appear in terms of these calculations? Okay with that? Do you think it makes sense? Right? This would formally cover your complete chapter. The only thing you would like to remember here at this point in time is if There are mid-year acquisitions. For example, I have a balance sheet ended 31st of December, let's say 9. Right? This is my reporting date basically wherein I have my NCAs, current assets, share capital, retained earnings, liabilities, something like that. That of the parent and that of the subsidiary. Right? Now let's imagine that these retained earnings are 100 and let's say 200 here. Just, just, just thinking of a scenario. Let's say this parent has acquired 70% stake in the subsidiary. Right? Now, they would tell you the date or they would at least let you know what was the amount of retained earnings as on a particular date. Let's assume that this company was acquired on 1st of January 2009 and on that date uh, no, sorry, I think I would like to kind of take another date, which is, let's say, 30th of June, 2009. Right? And this company was formed on 1st of January, 2009. So, there was a company which came into existence one year back. And this, the same company, was acquired by another company six months later from this date or six months back from the reporting date. Right? Now, this retained earning is 200. On this particular date, there would have been no retained earnings at all. It would have been zero of course because the company didn't even start. Right? Now, this 200, as per a logical understanding or as per, I would say, using the common sense principles that on day one, the profits were nil. Right? Day 365 or last day, these are 200. Can I say as on 30th of June 09, the profit would have been 100? I am just uniformly distributing this profit. Right? Just to identify, 
how much profits were there on the date of acquisition and how much of the profits after that. This profit is used for the calculation of goodwill and the remaining profit that is another 100 is used for distribution between parent and NCI I would say. Yep. So when there are some mid-year acquisitions you would need to understand what's your reporting date and what is your date of acquisition. That's, that's, more, that's the most important question that you should have an answer on as far as the consolidated financial statements are concerned. Okay with that? Superb. Now this formally ends your chapter number 4 and while we have this chapter number 4, chapter 5 is just the same. There is no difference between the two. What we do is, we have been talking about balance sheets so far. And when I say a balance sheet or SOFP, we prepare it as on a particular date. Do you agree with me? Right? On that date, how much are the assets? On that date, how much are the liabilities? On that date, how much are my retained earnings, or share capital and this and that. Right? Now, when I say I'm, I'm actually, for example, in the last example we saw that we acquired a company on 30th of June. We don't really care much about what happened in the past because when we prepare a balance sheet or SOFP, we are preparing it as on that particular date. Whatever the assets are there on that particular date, they would be reported into the group's numbers. Whatever the liabilities are, they would be a part of the gross liabilities as well. Right? But when I talk about SOCI, that is your income statement, I prepare it. for the period or for the year ended. That is, I am looking at basically a statement for a particular period. How much is the revenue that you made during a month? You don't call it how much have you made it at the moment. No, you don't call it like that, right? How much is the total revenue? How much are the total expenses? What is the profitability made by you over a period of time? That's what we talk about, right? So at this point in time, I would like to understand that if I am preparing SOCI, that is, I have a parent and a subsidiary forming a group, I would like to know that if I have to prepare a consolidated SOCI, I am not looking at something called as pre acquisition sales or expenses or anything like that. That means that if I acquired a company on a particular date, although the assets and liabilities of this company are mine, that is from the group's viewpoint, but any sales or purchases or expenses or other incomes made by this company before this date do not belong to the group. That is all we would like to say. Right? That simply means that if I am acquiring one company that is from parent to subsidiary to form a group, any pre-acquisition sales, expenses or incomes or you know, uh, purchases, they would not be a part of your group financial statements. Uh, that's a bit of a tricky situation at times because you may be required to prepare SOCI for year ended, let's say, 31st December 09, whatever, right? When you say that you are preparing an SOCI for the year ended, that simply means something starts from 1st of January 9 ends by 31st of December 9. Anything after this has no relevance. Anything before this has no relevance either. Right? Now, one important thing I would like to remember here is, if I am acquiring this company that is a subsidiary, say on 30th of June 09. From the group's viewpoint, I have my parents SOCI and of course I have my subsidiaries SOCI also. Now the parent would prepare it from the day one of course, but the subsidiaries numbers would be compiled or they would be added together or consolidated from the date of date of acquisition that is 1st of July 09. That is the only thing you would like to remember here, nothing beyond that. Right? Something like the retained earnings charge that we prepared a while back, it is actually coming as in your answer now. That is the final consolidated SOCI, right? 
the same principles of cancellation of intergroup sales, intergroup purchases. It may so happen that one company has given loan to another and by virtue of this there is interest income coming in. So that interest income against the interest expense would also be eliminated from the gross viewpoint. Right? This is the only logic you would like to remember. And on that basis, I may say that we can have a look at this example 1 given on page number 196. Have a careful reading of this and let's try to prepare this together. Just keep it in mind whenever a consolidation question comes, the date of reporting and the date of acquisitions are very important. The requirement is prepare C S O C I for the year ended 31st of December 2009. Right? That's the one thing. Let's just prepare this small question here in front of itself. So this P and okay, that's Z and X. That's okay. And I would have my consolidated column also. Now keep it in mind, you do not need to repeat all these things. You do not need to prepare these columns everywhere. I am just doing it for the sake of writing the question. But for the purposes of the answer, you just need to prepare this column and ignore these columns altogether. Right? I have my revenue. That is 1260 and 520. Cost of sales 420 210 giving me 840 and 310. Distribution cost 180 and 60. Admin expenses 120 and 90. Investment income 36. PBT. One thirty and twenty-five. Uh, the profit for the year. PAT is four forty-six and one hundred eighty-nine. Other comprehensive income. Other comprehensive income. Uh, one hundred and fifty. One hundred and fifty. All right. Total comprehensive income four forty-six and one eighty-nine. Four forty-six. No, five forty-six, right? Sorry. Yep, five forty-six and one eighty-nine. One eighty. Fine. Right? This is what is our question actually. What is the additional information given? During the year ended. Now, the first information is obviously this. 1st of January 2007 date of acquisition comes. That simply means whatever is the sales or expenses made by Xavier in this case would be added in the consolidated financial statements. We acquired this company 3 years back from the reporting date. Right? So, I would like to remember that. Apart from this, so this is my date of acquisition. Apart from that, it says that 31st of December 2009, Zebedee, that is parents sold goods worth 84,000. That is at a markup of 50% on cost. Right? And dollar thirty-six thousand worth still in inventory. That is one point. Second point is PPE of X was 50,000 extra. And the useful life is 5 years. I will come to these points in a while. Finally, there is an impairment 15,000. And fourth point is Xavier paid dividend of 48. Thousand. These are the four points and these amounts are all in thousands of course. Right? Now, let us use these points one by one. I may rather prefer to, okay, that, I think we can use this as well. We said that there is a sale made by one company to another. From the group's viewpoint, 
the total says do you agree with me it is going to be 1260 plus 520 minus 84 or 840 rather no 84 it is going to be yeah 84 right okay with that from the cost of sales view point it is going to be 420 plus 210 minus 84 first of all because what is being sold by one is being also purchased by one so cost of sales would be adjusted to that extent now it says that on the sale of 84 This is a 50% markup on cost. So when I look at my cost plus profit is equal to sales, I have 100 plus 50 is equal to 150, right? So my margin on sales is one third. Okay with that? Now there is inventory worth 36,000 still remaining into the books. That means that my profit is or my inventory is increased to that extent of one third of 36,000, which is 12,000, right? Now this twelve thousand is nothing else but a reduction into the profitability. When I say reduction into the profitability, can I say an increase in the costs? Right? We are just representing the cost of sales. Right? When I say cost of sales, it is nothing else but an expense. So when I reduce my profits, I may rather put it like this also. By the way, if you want me to do that, I can put it like this also. But since I am looking at my gross profit as my residual figure. I'm just adding it back here. Yeah. One and the same thing. Yeah. Okay with that. This adjustment is over now, right. right? The second adjustment says that the property plant equipment of the subsidiary is higher by fifty thousand when it was acquired. Right. Now we just talked about that same concept. When the value of the asset increases, it results into a higher depreciation amount, right. right? Which has not been charged so far by the subsidiary, right? Now. The excess depreciation is uh, excess value is fifty thousand. There is useful life of five years. Can I say that for this particular year, a depreciation of ten is not yet charged by the company? So what I do is I further add this ten to the cost of sales because this is accounting policy of the company also. They say that any depreciation should be charged to the cost of sales. Assume it to be a factory, for example, a factory building. Uh, factory building depreciation is usually charged as part of cost of the sales as a direct cost, right? Since they are given it already, we are just using like that. Okay with this? I am done even with this adjustment, right? The next one is there is an impairment and there is still a sentence given there. It says NCI is measured at the fair value. So what I am going to do is basically, since I am looking at my consolidated numbers, I'll just come to the point as of now. I'm just charging this impairment. What is the amount? Fifteen thousand, right? To my cost of sales to begin with. We'll split this between both the parent as well as the NCI. Got the point? Right? Had it been only a, uh, had the NCI been calculated on a proportion of asset method, I would have charged to my parent's accounts and not the subsidiary account. Okay with that? Yep. This point is over as well. And finally, X period is in a forty-eight thousand. I'll come to this adjustment in, in, in you know, in, in some, uh, in some logical viewpoint. When you say that X is paying a dividend, who is supposed to receive the dividend? Parent NCI. Of course, parent and NCI. NCI, right? That's the right question. Now, parent receiving a dividend, can I say it is going to be a parent's income? Right. right? It would have been a part of the investment income of the parent okay. to the extent of shareholding, of course. Right? right? Now, when he when he is saying that X is paying a dividend of forty-eight thousand, how much is going to the parent? Seventy-five percent, which is thirty-six, right? So this thirty-six is nothing else but group income and a group dividend. I would eliminate this from this. From the group's viewpoint, there is no dividend and there is no income also, right? This is what is the logic. Now, if I just go back, even my this adjustment is getting over, right? How about this twelve? We don't worry because we do, we are not preparing anything about NCI at all as of now. We'll prepare something about NCI when there is a balance sheet question, for example. So we don't bother much. Yep. Now, when I look at this gross profit, I would have my residual figure, whatever the amount may be. Can you just calculate that? Can you? All right. So this is six hundred. Sixteen hundred 
1696, okay? Giving a profit of one 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 three, right? Yeah. Right. Then I would say my distribution cost of one eighty plus sixty. Right. Admin cost of one twenty plus ninety, yeah. resulting into a profit from operations to the extent of triple one three minus two forty minus two one ten, which is uh, six 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 three. Is it? Yeah. My investment income is nil. So my PBT is 663. My gross profit, or sorry, uh, tax expenses is going to be 130 plus 25. That is 155. That is 508. Right? And then finally I have profit for the year, which is 508, of course, right? Okay. Now this 508 from the group's viewpoint. Something belongs to the parent and something belongs to the NCI. Right? Now, do you agree with me that whatever is the profit earned by the parent is any case the parent's profit? NCI has no share of that. Right? But, of this profit of subsidiary, something belongs to the parent and something belongs to the NCI. So what we do, we just take this amount, which is 138 if I'm not wrong, right? Or 135, is it? How much is the amount? How much is my subsidiary's profit? It is 135. Profit for the year. Yep. Given there, right? So 135 is the profit of the year of the subsidiary in the standard loan. Of which there is yet to be made an adjustment of 10. That is of the depreciation. There is yet to be made an adjustment for impairment. There would not be any adjustment about your unrealized profit because the profit is earned by the parent there. Right. We don't bother. Right? So effectively, 110 is the actual group's profit from subsidiary's viewpoint. Right. Now this profit should get split between the parent and NCI right. to the extent of 25% here. Right? And what is that amount? Twenty-seven point five. So what is saying? What I'm saying is that out of this total profit of five zero eight, twenty-seven point five zero belongs to NCI, and of course the balance belongs to the parent, which is four eighty point five zero. Right. So when I do that, I have this five zero eight. I must, from the examination viewpoint, segregate the amounts between how much pertains to the parent and how much pertains to the NCI. Right. right? And finally, I have this amount of 150, which is a part of other comprehensive income. But this other comprehensive income also has two components. When I say other comprehensive income, I would, I would like to remember that these are my unrealized incomes. Right? So from the consolidated viewpoint, also there are some unrealized incomes that need to be spread between the parent and the NCI. Now, the NCI share out of this 50 is 25%? 12.5. Remaining 37.5 plus 100 is going to be my parent share. Okay with that? This is what it is all about. Your SOCI concept is covered for this particular part. Nothing beyond that. You would like to have a look at this question once again. But this is what it is all about. Now your, your questions, I mean the solutions that, given, that are given in the question are a bit different from what we are doing in here. So we would have a different way of presenting this. Indeed, assume revaluation reserves. Okay, but uh, profits uh, are um, this, uh, yeah. still uh, on worth of but this is not this is not the one I'm talking about. That is that's a URP and when you talk about other comprehensive income, these are unrealized gains from the perspective of say a revaluation. They are, they are entirely different. Don't worry about that. So, so let's not be confused. It's a fair question to ask. Are these the same? No, these are not at all the same. Because when you talk about these standalone financial statements, which, is, which I just cleared, they are, you know, uh, from, from the perspective of the parent, 
that profit of 12,000 was a realized profit. So it is not a part of your unrealized gains at all. Right? So if you see it from that perspective, it becomes a bit easier to understand that. Okay with that? Right? There is a small concept of uh, statement of changes in equity also. I may skip it for the time being. I may rather concentrate on something called as associates and joint ventures. So we have basically, when you look at let us say making an investment in shares of another company. Right? There are three categories or three kinds of investment that you can actually make. One is your normal investment. Second is for the purposes of control and third is something that gives you significant influence. We will talk about this in a while but when I say normal investment me, or me buying shares of Unilever right? 5 shares, 10 shares, 500 shares, maybe 5 lakh shares, whatever, right, depending upon my, you know, uh, deep pockets and depending upon how much, and you know, uh, what, what exactly I want to do with that. Let's say I am making a percentage or I am buying a 5 percent stake into other company. Now, when I am when I'm a shareholder, I am actually the owner of the company, right. Now, it doesn't mean that I simply go to the company and just start running the business. I don't do that, right. I am just buying a stake into the other company. And I'm entitled for dividend and I'm entitled to go to the AGM and basically listen to the people, what they say, what is the decision they're making and things like that. My role is, you know, quite good to ask questions. But I cannot basically, you know, uh, uh, make a judgment or take a decision on my own by virtue of this 5% stake or maybe a bit even higher, higher than that, right? So all I'm doing is I'm going to the AGMs, I'm looking at my, you know, financial statements, I'm raising questions to the management, what have they done, what are the plans? And uh, you know their commentary about, for example, the financial performance of the company. I don't, I don't know much beyond that, right? So in a way, of course, I'm not controlling it. One thing is for sure. But then I'm just acting as a normal owner. Now, this owner or this particular investment in the shares of the company can be done for trading purposes, or can be done for long-term purposes also, right? When I do it on trading purposes, it is always measured at fair value. And even for that matter, if it is for long term purposes, it is again measured at fair value. Right? So, we do not really cover it here because it is part of your financial estimates, IAS 39 and IFRS 9 kind of concepts. We do not really worry about that. We have covered it already. Second part is when you say that you have control. We presume that if I have more than 50 percent stake, I have a control over the company and by default of this, by virtue of this, the other company is my subsidiary. Right? So, something which is coming in more than 50 percent, I presume I have a control and that is my subsidiary. But then, other than this and this, there could be a situation wherein while you have a major amount of control or major amount of stake, you do not have control over the other company. That is, if your holding is more than 20 percent, but less than 50 percent, you are presumed to be having something called as significant influence. That is, you may not be able to control the business, but you cannot be ignored either. I am not saying that even this shareholder is being ignored, right? Even he has the right to ask questions. But then this particular shareholder between, you know, say 20 30 percent of stake within the company, his decisions would matter. His, you know, uh, questions would be taken, uh, I would say, I, I do not say it more seriously, but I would say they would be taken as a part of influence. Right? As good as just think about, you know, uh, the opposition government, something like that. I don't, I don't really use the term opposition government here. The idea is that somebody who is having a stake to the extent of, you know, uh, 20 percent and above, but less than 50 percent, his presence cannot be ignored as far as your, you know, uh, businesses are concerned. So when we say that, let's let's just take a scenario around this in terms of what happens with these kind of investments. Let's say that there is a company in which there are three shareholders, that is A Limited, let's say B Limited and let's say 
C limited. And so there's a company called D limited. A limited 60% stake, D limited, B limited 30% stake, and the balance to stake belongs to C limited. Right? Now, this particular company, of course, controls. So A limited would consolidate D limited to the extent of 100% of the assets, and 40% goes to my NCI. Right? This is what we have done already. Right? Now, this C limited is nothing else but it would measure the investment at fair value. If it is done for trading purposes, again fair value. If it is done for long term purposes, that is also fair value. But B limited, and that is obviously the question about associates, B limited is having something called as significant influence over the other entity. That is, if B wants, it can certainly influence the decisions of the company, about the company D limited, right? It can go against A limited and may or may not let A limited work as per their needs, right? I am not saying that they would be against A limited as such, but then their arguments would be again taken very, very impactfully. So, they have certainly an influence over the decision making about D limited as far as their shareholding is concerned, right? So, when I say that there is significant influence, it is nothing else but referred to as investment in associates. Right? Okay with that? Now, the easy part about investment in associates is, we know that it is A limited which is consolidating D limited. We don't, we don't mind that. We have done that kind of calculations already. But B limited, from the group's viewpoint, if I am preparing B limited group's financial statements, I would say that from the group's viewpoint, I would show investment in associate that is D limited plus share of profits in D limited. That is, if D limited earns, for example, $100,000. Right? Do you agree with me? 30% belongs to C lim uh, C limit B limited in that case. Right? I mean, B, uh, D limited has not or may not have declared a dividend so far, but the profit earned by D is also attributable to B, to the extent of 30% uh, of $100,000. What we say is, whatever investment is made by B in D, that would be added or that would be increased to the extent of share of profits in D limited. That is, if this investment was worth, say, let's say, 1 million, I would have another 30,000 coming in as a part of my investment. So, what we do is basically, we would simply take the investment at its original cost, we'll add this share of profit by saying, group investments is increased and of course your group's profits are also increased. The fact remains, you haven't realized this money so far. But then this is a part of your realized gains only. Okay with that? This is what is referred to as something called as equity method of accounting. When I say equity method of accounting, I am just looking at my investment and increasing to the extent of an increase in the equity. Right? So, the equity is coming through obviously the profitability. So, I am just increasing the value of my investments by increasing the equity stake. Alright? I am just saying that I, obviously the profit has been declared. So, my investment value is a bit higher than the original cost. If it were a loss, naturally the investment would reduce. This is what it is all about. Yep? Okay with that? Now, the same question arises here also. What do we do if the parent company sells to associates or the associate sells to the parent company. Right? Again an intergroup adjustment coming. There is a company D limited which is an associate and there is a B limited which is a parent in that sense. Right? So when I say that B sells to D. Right? <coughs> there may have been a profit earned by B here. Right? From the group's perspective and just assuming a 30 percent stake of course let's say that uh, there is a sale made by b of 100 against the cost of let's say 60 so 
So there was an item worth 60 sold for 100 to D. Right? Ideally speaking, B has earned a profit of 40. But from the group's perspective, right? From the group's perspective, I mean, imagining that this has not been sold off by D any further, you know, uh, D uh, still has this inventory lying in the books, right? Now, B has earned a profit in, in 40 in its standard statement, that is absolutely fine. When I look at the accounting of D's balance sheet and P and L, do you agree with me, first of all, that D's assets, liabilities, revenue, expenses would have gone to A, of course? Because that is getting consolidated with A, since A has, an, uh, A has a control over D, right? How about B? B says, would any case come in the B's consolidated financial statements? But it would not have, of course, the sales of D. Because the sales of D are going to the sales of A, right? So when I say that, there is a sale or an intra-group sale that is between a parent and an associate being made, I have no impact coming in my CSOCI because I don't even consider these sales anywhere in my financial statements. It is only my parent's sale which is coming in, right? Similarly, if I talk about cost of sales or the purchases, P's or the, in this case D limited's purchases are also not coming in my books if I am B limited. These are all going to my a limited. So there is some transition between A and D that is being taken care of there itself. But any transition between D and B, as far as sales or purchases are concerned, they have no relevance. Similarly, it may so happen that B has sold on something on credit to D. Now, there is a receivable in the books of B, payable in the books of D. But the payables in the books of D are getting consolidated with that of A. So even these receivables or payables have no relevance as far as accounting is concerned. That simply means, in a, in a very, very simple manner, I may say that I would ignore the sales, purchases, assets and liabilities of D Limited for the purposes of B's consolidation. That is all it means, nothing beyond that. However, I am still back on this viewpoint that if there is an unrealized profit or there is a sale made by parent to the associate, do you agree with me there is a profit increase in the books of parent and there is an increase in the Inventory of D, right? Now, since this inventory doesn't come into my consolidated financial statements, the way I the way I take it is, and of course, I'm not doing a hundred percent consolidation here either. I'm just looking at my share of profits for the purposes of consolidation. What I do is, from the parents' viewpoint, this is effectively the profit which is not yet earned by the group. That means. If I am having 30% stake here, right? Ideally, when I make a sale of 100 or earn a profit of 40, I am selling it to two people effectively. One is 70%, one is 30%. Now, the 70% sale made to delimited is realized because I don't know them. I have only a stake of 30%, right? So, to this extent, my profits are unrealized. So, what I am going to do is basically, I would simply reduce my profits to the extent of 12 and I would reduce the value of my investments also to the extent of 12. Same question arises, who sells to whom? That is what the idea behind consolidation. If parent sells to associate, reduce the profit of the parent. And of course on the simultaneous side, reduce the investments also because you do not consolidate the inventory. However, if I say that the associate is selling to the parent, do you agree with me that associate is on the profit? Reduce the profit. Right? Now, in the consolidated financial statements, B's inventory that is that of the parent is again lying within the financial statements. Reduce the value of inventory. So in either of the cases, I am any case reducing the profits of the respective entity, B or D as the case may be. But I would look at inventory if the sale is made to B and I am looking at investment if the sale is made to the associate or D. Right? This is the only adjustment I can think of from the examination viewpoint and also that is being frequently tested. I would like to kind of understand it fair. Okay? This is what is about your associates. But primarily I would like to understand it from this viewpoint 
if I have something called as significant influence, that is where my associates come into the picture. Right? Your examination may want you to do some calculations on three companies, in which most likely the first company is the parent, second being a subsidiary, and third being an associate. Right? Good part. If this is a balance sheet question, I consolidate this, I consolidate this, I don't do anything about this. I consolidate liabilities of these two, nothing about this. But the profit of this company would get added to the investment in associates. That too, of course, a percentage. Okay with that? This is the kind of adjustment I would like to remember. And if it were an income statement question, parent, subsidiary, and associate, I add revenues of this, add revenues of this, ignore this. Take all these, ignore this. Right? But the profit share would be shown as a part of your realized income. Whatever the profit may be. So we are just ignoring all these columns. Just looking at the equity portion every time. Right? There's a reason why it is referred to as an equity method of accounting. Okay with that? Now, the final discussion that we have about today's session is something called joint ventures. Ever heard of joint venture as a concept? What is that? Anything at all? <coughs> For example, why would they join hands? Usually they are competitors probably. Usually they are competitors to be doing that. Yep. No. When I say that this is joint venture, yes there is, I mean as you rightly mentioned that two companies or two or more companies come together to do a project together. Right? Let's Absolutely. Let's say about DMRC, Delhi Metro Rail Corporation. Right? You would have seen some, you know, uh, indeed it's, it's a joint venture of a few things. But I am just talking about some project within that, that's more realistic project. Let's say there is a company called Lassen and Tubro and there is another company called Gamanity. There could be few more companies of course which really come in. Let's say DMRC has a project, phase 4 wherein they would like to have Hundred kilometers of lines to be spread in terms of construction of station, uh, construction of uh, you know that path, the tracks, maintenance, and everything. Right? They reach LNT. Now LNT is pretty happy about it because it's a huge project. It's going to give them you know uh, great revenues, of course profitability, everything is there. But then LNT is a bit concerned that either on the basis of the resources it has, or maybe due to the risk appetite, it may not be able to do this business completely. Right? So what LNT does, it goes to Gemman and says, boss, I have this project. Why not do it together? Right? Okay with that? What LNT tells that I will have my own assets, I will have my own funding, whatever revenue is there, we'll share it on the basis of whatever you contribute. Right? Let's say 60% goes to LNT and 40% goes of course to Yemen. Expenses of course, I will hire my own team, own supervisors, own workers, own labor, own capital, own machinery and everything and of course I control those. Right? So the expenses are also to the extent of whatever is the contribution into the project. Yemen says the same thing. I will have my own assets, my own funding, my own way of banking, deposits, guarantees, CCs, CC limits that is, right? And all that stuff. I will have my share of revenue and of course I will contribute to my own expenses. Right? Now, for example, this project begins. So there are, there is a site wherein LNT is sitting and Gemini is sitting as well. Right? So the one worker is doing on this side and some workers are doing on this side. Let's say something goes wrong here. That there is a, you know, a pillar which fells down. Due to which there is a, there is a huge loss for example. Do you think LNT has anything to do with that? No. Nope. LNT is just concerned about its assets, its funding, its revenue and its expenses. Whatever is the penalty or whatever the losses, they are necessarily borne by Gammon India. Similarly, if something goes wrong here, Gammon has nothing to do. Right? 
so while this particular association is in form of a joint venture i don't use the word joint venture by the way i would use something called as <coughs> basically there are two ways of looking at it one is joint venture and joint operations when i say that i have lnt and gammon coming together and doing some operations jointly this is what is referred to as joint operations right what what would what is going to happen basically they would form something called a new company for example lnt gammon limited i'm just i'm just using one you know fictitious or hypothetical situation that they create a company in which lnt would have its own assets its own revenue its own expenses its own funding and gammon has its own piece of each such category right what happens is basically lnt would have a control over its assets liabilities that is funding for example if something is running for running short as far as the you know doing the execution of work is concerned lnt would be responsible for to arrange for the funding right there is a need for supervisors or engineers or personnel it is lnt's responsibility as far as his work is concerned right, right? so there is a joint operational exercise happening that operationally lnt is looking at its own things and gammon is looking at its respective things right that is what is referred to joint operations do you agree with me when lnt as a company consolidates this company that is lnt gammon india limited so there is a lnt company of course lnt limited it would have its own shares that is of the parent plus percentage of shares of lnt gammon limited so the assets of the parent plus in this particular company the percentage of asset which is being controlled by lnt would be coming in here right okay with that liabilities total liability of the parent plus percentage of liabilities of lnt gammon revenues total revenue of lnt limited plus percentage of revenue of lnt gammon expenses similar to the same thing so what we do is basically we do something like proportionate consolidation in that case okay with that the examination may tell you that you are required to do a proportional consolidation this is what is the logic in case of holding subsidiary we do a 100% consolidation in case of a joint operation or a proportional consolidation we do a percentage consolidation but the logic remains just the same okay with that right finally when talk about a joint venture you may have heard of these telecom companies like airtel or airtel or what these companies are all about these are uh, companies telecom companies obviously right so there is a airtel vodafone airtel etc right now obviously they need some telecom towers to run everything right so there is a you know kind of something which is receiving signals and things like that i don't i don't know it look like a signal or something like that but anyhow right now who actually maintains these towers or signals now they, we know it that without these signals these companies cannot operate they would eventually fail because if there is no connectivity people would not use this mobile phones for example at all right now since it is in their vested interest to have these things coming up and have these things being run smoothly what they do is they would together form a company for example there is a company called as indus towers limited there is a company actually in india in gurgaon for that matter right what this company does it would be responsible for maintenance running operations profitability of all these towers they you know kind of create these structures look at all these uh you know uh, i don't know bandwidth or we call it uh, you know uh, the spectrum you know uh, release and things like that so they all 
they all look into the radiation aspects and all that. So that is being done by Indus Tower. Now, Indus Tower is primarily a company owned by these companies together. So it may so happen, ASL has 70% stake, it has 20%, it has 10%. Now these companies are not bothered about the operations of Indus Tower Limited. They don't care. They say, leave it to the management of Indus Tower. They are experts in doing that. Right? But then, they have a share of profit as far as Indus Tower is concerned. Right? They do not control this company primarily, but they still work or kind of control it jointly together for identifying how is Indus operating. Doing. Right? They have made an investment, for example, 70% by Airtel, 20% by Vodafone, 10% by Airtel into this company. What they are all concerned about, whether this company makes profit and if it makes profit, do we get a respective share or not? Right? The treatment of this, this is just as good as equity method of accounting. That is, the way we did for an associate, we are just going to apply the same principles as far as joint ventures are concerned. Right? So, when you say joint venture, it is the venture which is jointly owned by Airtel, Vodafone and Airtel. They have nothing to do as far as the operations of the company is concerned. They have made an investment and they are looking at the growth of the investment by looking at the profit share. Right? This is what it is all about. So, when I say that we are talking about consolidation, I am looking at few possible scenarios. That is, there is a holding and a subsidiary and an associate. The holding and a subsidiary and another subsidiary. So, I am going to see, so I am going to see three companies of course as far as my question is concerned. I am going to see holding plus subsidiary plus a joint operation or a holding plus subsidiary plus a joint venture. Nothing beyond that. I do not expect A and A coming together. I do not expect A and J or A and J B coming together here. So, the all possibilities I would see these things coming. I have a parent 100 percent and share of profit here. I am a parent 100 percent and 100 percent here. Right? Of course, NCI would be there. Right? I am a parent 100 uh, percent consolidation plus NCI and of course, proportionate consolidation as far as joint operations is concerned. And finally, I am a parent 100 percent consolidation plus NCI plus share of profit. Okay, with that, this ends again your next chapter. I think chapter number 6 is covered here. But I would, I would want you to do a couple of questions before we meet next time on this. Right? So, but the logic or the conceptual understanding of consolidated financial statements is this only. The next class will have more complex discussions in terms of what if a company is having a normal investment and it goes to acquire a company to the extent of an associate that is significant influence and what if it goes further to the purpose of control, something called as a step acquisition and what also if it goes just to reverse back. That is, I have a subsidiary but I have just sold off my stake that becomes an associate or maybe a normal investment. We are going to cover all that in the next session. Before we meet, I am yet to cover by the way statement of changes in equity, pretty pretty basic uh, you know uh, understanding of what are the changes coming in equity. I would, I would keep that for the next session, but then I would request you to do uh, you know, uh, the SOCI questions, the CSOCI questions and also that of associates in joint ventures. Right? So, this is where we end, this, uh, to end today's session and any question that you may come across, just feel free. I am absolutely available and that is it. Yeah? Sure. All right. Thanks Manisha. I think we are done. Thank you.